The city of Surat in the Indian state of Gujarat has one of the largest diamond industries in the world. Meanwhile, India's diamond hub, Surat, which is situated in the state of Gujarat, is all set to open the world's largest diamond market. From an Indian perspective, uh, the current market size for diamonds is about six and a half billion dollars. Surat is the most important part as concerned with diamonds in the complete world. World diamond trade was dominated by Jewish diamond dealers in Belgium. However, 65% of the community was killed in the dreadful Holocaust. Surat is known as the world's diamond capital. Nine out of ten rough diamonds mined worldwide are cut in Surat. Hi everybody, the diamond industry of India is one of the most valuable industries in the country. And while most of us know Surat as the diamond capital of India, very few of us know that in 1970s, India was nowhere to be found in the diamond market of the world. This market was very tightly controlled by the Jews of Belgium. But in the next three decades, a community from India did something so brilliant that they went on to become the most dominating force in the diamond market of the world. This community that I'm talking about is none other than the Jain community of India. And the Jains have done such an amazing job that today India commands a staggering 93% market share in the cutting and polishing market of the world. We exported $23 billion worth of diamonds and it accounts for an insane 10% of the total merchandise exports of India. In fact, even Gautam Adani is one of these Jains who became a diamond trader and carried this legacy forward. And this diamond trading is the reason why he became a millionaire at the age of 20. So the question is, how did the Jains take control of the diamond industry of the world? How did they beat the Jews of Belgium? What was the business strategy that made Jains so successful? And what are the business lessons that we need to learn from the incredible community of Jains in India? But before we move on, we have a quick announcement from Growth School. Did you know that diamond industry has started to extensively use AI algorithms to make the process of diamond production more efficient and cost effective? Similarly, the use of new technologies like AI and ChatGPT is disrupting all jobs and industries right now. Even me and my team have started using these AI tools and ChatGPT for research and production. And if you also want to learn how to unlock the superpower of chat, GPT and AI for free, Growth School has something very, very special for you. Growth School runs a 3-hour paid chat, GPT and AI workshop. This workshop is run by my dear friend and the founder of Growth School, Webov Sisinthi himself. I myself have attended the workshop and I absolutely loved it. Last time, thousands of Think School subscribers attended the workshop and the feedback was amazing. So I asked Webov to do this workshop for free for the first thousand Think School learners who joined the workshop using the link below. Yes, you heard that right. This paid workshop is free for you. And the interesting thing is that using chat, GPT and AI has increased my team's work efficiency, output and speed by 3x. That's why I would say no matter who you are, whether you are a working professional, entrepreneur, creator or a student, this workshop can be very, very helpful for you. So if you found this useful, use the link below to be among the first thousand people to join Growth School's workshop to take advantage of this offer. To understand how Jains became the legends in the diamond market, we first have to understand the steps involved in producing the diamonds. If you look at this chart, the first step of diamond process is exploration and mining. Here's where a diamond mining company identifies a viable diamond deposit and starts mining. Currently, the biggest diamond deposits are in Botswana and Russia. Then comes the second step, which is sorting and valuing. So once the mining is done, the rough diamonds are extracted and they're sorted by size, shape, quality and color. Then these rough diamonds are sold to diamond cutting companies for cutting and polishing. And as the name suggests, diamonds are cut and polished with a high degree of craftsmanship at this point. And this is where diamonds go on to become the beautiful pieces of gems that we know of. Then the diamonds are graded and certified by an internationally recognized gemological institute. And this certification is done based on four characteristics, cut, carat, clarity and color. Now, I will get into the depth of grading when we cover the lab-grown diamonds case study. But for now, all you need to know is that diamonds are classified based on four C's, which are cut, carat, clarity and color. Then, based on this grading, these diamonds are sold to the jewellery manufacturers all across the world, who then make jewellery out of it and then sell it to the jewellery retailer. And after this, the jewellery retailer sells it to people like you and me. This is the value chain of the diamond industry. 
If this is very very clear to you, let's dive into the 1950s diamond industry. This is a story that dates back to 1950s Belgium. In Belgium, there is a city called Antwerp. This is when World War II had just gotten over and 65% of the Jewish population in Antwerp had been eliminated by Hitler. From the 15th century onwards, world diamond trade was dominated by Jewish diamond dealers in Belgium. However, 65% of the community was killed in the dreadful Holocaust. But even then, a handful of Jews in Antwerp gained complete control over the diamond trade in Antwerp. And it's not like they controlled just one segment of the supply chain. They were dominating all parts of the supply chain, starting from the purchase of rough diamonds, to polishing, to even the retail jewellery business. During this time, it was very difficult to beat the Jews because of three reasons. Number one, Jews had witnessed the massacre of Hitler because of which they were very protective of everything from their trade to their identity. Secondly, the Jews were so supportive of each other that if you were a Jew and you did not get a loan from the bank, the Jewish community itself would offer you a loan so that you can start your business. Similarly, as a Jew, if you start a cutting and polishing business, then just to support you, the Jewish diamond traders will give you work so that you can prosper during the initial stages. And lastly, even if they had a dispute, the Jews appointed a Jewish arbitrator who used to solve the disputes as soon as possible and they did not have to rely on the court. This way, the matters were resolved without wasting time and money. So this conflict resolution of the Jews was one of the most effective systems in their business. So overall, if you were a Jew, it was easier for you to excel because of your community support. But if you were anyone other than the Jews, it was very difficult for you to get loans and you had to struggle a lot to get good clients. This is when, in the 1960s, some Indians started arriving in Antwerp. These Indians were none other than the smart and sharp Jains from Gujarat. So the question is, if the Jews were so dominating, then how did the Jains capture the diamond industry of the world? Well, as it turns out, just like any brilliant entrepreneur, the Jains found a gap in the market. And this gap was the small diamond market. To tell you about it, the Jains noticed that Jews were only interested in large diamonds and they saw no value in small diamonds at all. This was because of three reasons. At the time, the global demand was centered majorly around large stones. Secondly, it was very difficult to cut and polish small diamonds. And since very few people bought it, it was not financially viable to spend time and labor on small diamonds. And because of both these problems, very few people in Antwerp had developed the expertise to polish small stones. So small diamond as a product was neither customer desirable nor market viable. And the Jews ignored them to such an extent that they called it diamond dust. What did they call it? Diamond dust. But guess what? This is where the Jains of India spotted a million dollar opportunity. Since the Jews called it diamond dust, the Jains were able to buy this diamond dust at a very low cost. And all thanks to their close-knit community, the Jains sent this diamond dust to India to check if they could develop the technique to cut and polish these small diamonds. And somehow, after the hard work of countless artisans and workers in Surat, the Jain community of India built a skilled workforce that could cut and polish small diamonds in the most economical manner possible. And after they were polished, these diamonds were shipped back to Belgium to be sold to diamond dwellers in Europe. Now the question over here is, if the Jains started selling diamonds in Europe, didn't the Jews notice these trades happening? And if they did, why didn't the Jews do anything to stop them? Well, as it turns out, even the Jews noticed the Jains selling small diamonds, but they did not feel threatened by it because for them, small diamonds were all about small margins, the costs were too low, and to them, it was an insignificant market. In fact, it is said that the Jews even provided credit facilities to the Jains in the beginning. But if you look at what the Jains were building in the background, it was just incredible. Firstly, they developed a high-quality, low-cost manufacturing process because the cost of labor in India was very, very low as compared to Antwerp. In fact, even in 2007, if you see this graph, while labor costs in Antwerp stood at $150 a carat, in Tel Aviv, Israel, it costed $100 a carat. In China, it costed $17 a carat, whereas in India, it costed only $10 a carat. This made and still makes India the most economical diamond hub in the world. So you can imagine how the cost would have been in the 1960s. Secondly, together as a community, the Jains built a formidable and high-tech workforce in Surat. The best part was that it was not done by a single person or a single company. This superior skill and workforce of the Jains was a result of a collective contribution from many, many individuals. For example, in the early 1900s, two enterprising brothers named 
Ganda Bai and Rangil Das started diamond cutting and polishing in Surat after they returned from South Africa. Venus Jewels founder Sevanti Bhai Shah played a critical role in upskilling the Indian diamond cutters and created a large scale world class manufacturing environment for high value natural diamonds in Surat. In 1956, H.B. Shah started a cutting and polishing unit for natural diamonds and welcomed workers from all communities. In the 1970s, Sevanti Bhai Shah even introduced the revolutionary concept of performance based pay system. And this system literally incentivized the artisans to deliver superior quality in their work. This is how, with each passing innovation, it was not just a single business that grew, but the entire community that learned from each other and started getting better. So eventually, the Jews could not achieve high profitability with small diamonds, but the Jains of India could easily make a profit in spite of shipping the diamonds all the way to India and back to Belgium. Secondly, the Jains had a powerful distribution network called the Angadias. These were local courier men who transported parcels of diamonds worth millions of dollars. They also had a chitti system, which was an informal system of promissory notes, transactions and even contracts. Now, do you realize this people? This was a big, big deal back then because today, if your sailor takes away 50 diamonds from you, you have the identity of the sailor, you have a signature and you can actually track him with his address. But back then, if your sailor walks away with 50 diamonds, he and his two generations can be financially free for life. So this trading system was very risky and a very high value system. And at the same time, the Jains did not have any option because if they didn't send the diamonds to India and ship it back to Europe, they could never have achieved profitability. So the question is, how did the Jains solve for trust in such a high cost, high risk business? Well, the answer to this lies in the values of the Jain community. And this is what did wonders to the diamond industry of the world. If you have a Jain friend, they will tell you that in business, Jains value honesty, family bonding and a long standing relationship with business partners over everything else. So if you and I do business, our relationship will not stop with us, but even our children and their children will trust each other and do business together. And the attributes that build these relationships are fairly simple, but very, very powerful attributes that anyone can follow. For example, the Jains that I have seen in business, if they like something, they will tell you honestly. If they don't like something, they will tell you honestly. And even if your business dealings fail, they will never leave the table with distaste. This is because the Jains understand that even if the deal did not go through this time, if you maintain a healthy relationship, next time, either they will have something valuable to sell to you or you will have something valuable to sell to them. And as far as my interaction with one of my Jain friends is concerned, he tells me that the risk to reward ratio of cheating in the community is very high. In simple words, if you're a part of the Jain community, just like the Jews, if you start a business, they will support you. If you're out of town and your wife and children need help, the Jain community will help you out. Tomorrow, if you run into financial trouble, the community together will help you and your family out. But if you cheat and abandon the community, you might have 50 diamonds, but the basic sense of security for your family will cease to exist. So the fear of no security overrides the greed to cheat. And secondly, I have no idea how, but the Jains have somehow managed to crack the code to scaling a family business. Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but I have seen many families break apart because of business. I've seen a lot of families fight because of business and even worse, I've seen families fight for three generations over business disputes that occurred 70 years ago. But when it comes to Jains, somehow they have very easily built and scaled family businesses for generations. So even though in business, families stand at the edge of cold wars and distaste, if done right, they could help you build the most trustworthy network in the market. In this case, because the Angadias who took and got back diamonds from India were intertwined with friends and family, they could be trusted with the shipment. And the community itself valued and respected the Chitti system. This is how the Jains were able to build a formidable and economical supply chain in the 1970s market. And thirdly, because of the tight community, they also built a great support system. So if there is someone in Surat who wanted to enter the diamond industry, he was guided and taught to do business by the community members themselves. If someone wanted to start a diamond polishing business, instead of treating them as competition, the Jain merchants supported them by giving them business. And even during the times of cash crunch, like I said before, the Jain community even gave credit to each other so that everyone can thrive and survive during crisis. This is because the Jains knew very well that their competition is not within themselves, but with the international merchants. They collaborated within the community to compete outside the community in the international market. 
This is all because of trust, community support and cheap labor. The Jains built an entire supply chain of diamonds starting from the delivery of stones to cutting to polishing to grading all the way till the distribution of diamonds in the international market. And within no time, their siblings, cousins and other community members started shifting to Antwerp, eventually resulting into a huge immigrant population of more than 400 Gujarati families in Belgium. This supply chain over time became so powerful that in the 1970s Antwerp, they had a skilled diamond labor force of 25 to 30,000 workers. This number was down to less than 1,000 as of 2015. Whereas today, Surat alone employs around 800,000 people in the business. While in 1966-67, we exported $28 million worth of diamonds, today India exports more than $23 billion worth of diamonds. This is how the genes of India solved for the market viability and technological feasibility problem of small diamonds. And this brings us to the next question. Like we saw in the beginning of the episode, the Jews did not bother to get into the small diamond market because the demand for small diamonds was not so high. So if the small diamonds market was not so significant, then how did these Jain diamond merchants make money? Well, as it turns out, in 1940s, a company called De Beers popularized a phrase called Diamond is Forever. 1938, De Beers commissioned ad agency N.W. Ayer & Son with making diamonds a necessary luxury in American lives. In 1947, Ayer copywriter Francis Geraghty came up with the slogan, A Diamond is Forever, and the association with eternal love was solidified. It's appeared in every De Beers advert since 1948, and it's been heralded as the advertising slogan of the century. This campaign is one of the longest campaigns ever executed, whose influence lasted for more than five decades. Now, during the first two decades, this campaign only appealed to the rich, and diamond became a symbol of love between couples only among the rich people. So if you ever proposed a girl for marriage, you had to have a diamond ring. But by 1970s, the campaign's influence even extended to the middle class people. So suddenly, even middle class people who didn't have the money to buy large diamonds aspired to have a diamond ring. This is where the demand for small diamond rings picked up because it was cheaper as compared to the big diamonds. And lastly, in general, people started appreciating small diamonds because of the changing taste in jewellery. So debuters, the rising middle class and the changing taste of people in jewellery automatically solved for customer desirability of small diamonds in the world market. So when the demand for small diamonds started rising in the world market, nobody was better prepared to embrace this wave than the Jains of Gujarat. And lastly, it was also the government policy and the geography of Surat that did wonders for the industry. If you see this map, Surat is located very close to the Arabian Sea, which has historically played a major role in establishing foreign trade. On top of that, Surat also had all the resources available to embrace an industrial revolution. They had great roads, they had reliable power connectivity, and most importantly, the government was also favoring the diamond trade with low import duties. This is how the Jains were not just able to penetrate into the market, but were also able to build a profitable business in the diamond industry. And within no time, the skill and tech they had became so sophisticated that the Jains started to cut, polish and grade diamonds better and cheaper than anyone else in the market. So obviously, if the Jains could deliver the same quality of diamonds as the Jews, why would the dwellers buy from Jews, right? Because with the Jain diamonds, the dwellers could make more profit. This is how the Jains became a dominating community in the diamond industry of the world. And because of their diligence and business acumen, today, the diamond cutting and polishing industry in India is an $18.6 billion market. India exported more than $23 billion worth of diamonds and more than 8 lakh people earn their livelihood from the diamond industry of India. This is how a group of sweet and sharp Jains became the legends in the diamond industry of the world. So the last question over here is, what are the business lessons that we need to learn from the rise of Jains in the diamond market of the world? Lesson number one, when you collaborate within the community and compete in the bigger market, it will help you become a formidable force in the industry. In this case, unlike the kings of India who kept on fighting within themselves only to lose to the invaders, the Jains very wisely chose to collaborate within themselves and compete in the international market. Lesson number two, culture and family values are extremely critical in nurturing the business acumen of the children. In this case, while the modern entrepreneurs learn the value of trust and integrity in B-schools, the Jains of 1970s had it ingrained in them because of the family values and culture that they practiced in the community. By the way, a very good friend of mine named Sarthag Auja recommended this book called Untangling Conflict for anyone who's running a family business. So do read this book because if Sarthag is reading it, it is a value bomb that can do wonders to your life. 
And the last lesson we have is solving for trust is one of the most important attributes in any community. And the growth of the community is directly proportional to the speed of trust in the community. In this case, because the Jains solved for trust using community support, collaboration and family businesses, they were able to build a formidable value chain for cutting and polishing diamonds in India. This is the story of the sweet and sharp Jains of India. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye. And to learn more about how you can use AI and chat GPT and grow in your career, do check out the workshop we have for the first thousand people from the link in the description.